Welcome to my complete digital art workflow. It's been a while since I've made a dedicated digital art video, especially delving into the details of how I produce my illustrations and designs. As a matter of fact, I don't think I've ever made a video quite like this. I'd like to dive into the devices I use, the apps and programs I use, how I set up my documents, the brushes and effects I use, and how I finalize the design and deliver it to the manufacturer and a whole lot more. Hopefully, this will answer a few of the questions I get regarding my workflow, and hopefully I'll come out the other side with a few cool pieces of art. Okay, to start out, let's talk a little bit about the devices I use. The main workhorse is the iPad Pro. I just upgraded my iPad this month. This is the old one, and this is the new one. The new one I got is the 2021 M1 12.9 inch fifth generation iPad Pro. It has 256 gigabytes of internal storage and I got it in space gray. I decided to get one generation older than the current generation and I also got this one refurbished on Amazon. So it's been pre-owned but it has been professionally inspected, tested and cleaned and it's been working great so far. Getting it this way ended up saving me $300 over buying the latest and greatest brand new one from Apple. I went with 256 gigabytes of storage because I checked my previous one and in all the time that I've used it and owned it I only used 68 gigabytes of total storage out of the 256 gigabytes I had available my previous iPad was a third generation 12.9 inch from 2019 which runs on the a12x bionic chip and it's worked great for years but I have noticed it slowing down a bit and it definitely slows down when I'm using Adobe fresco on both of these beautiful iPads I'm using the second Second generation Apple Pencil. The input of the Apple Pencil feels absolutely perfect to me with zero discernible latency and just a very natural feel coupled with the excellent portability of the iPad and its ability to do so many other things outside of art means it would take a whole heck of a lot to get me to consider any other device for making digital art. On a side note, when I did get my new iPad, I got a second Apple Pencil for my second iPad. And for some reason on Amazon, it's priced at $89. On the Apple website, it's $129. It's always been $129. But this Amazon listing labeled as the Apple Store, a real authentic Apple Pencil 2, not some knockoff, at the time of making this video is $89 on Amazon. This of course made me super hyped because Apple stuff like never goes on sale. But hey, that's a W baby. Okay, on all my iPads, I like to install the paper-like screen protector. When I first started making digital art, my biggest gripe was the feeling of the hard plastic tip of the Apple Pencil pressing against the glass screen. It just didn't feel right. It was slippery, it was, it was weird. But after I got paper-like, it felt very similar to how it felt when I was drawing on my sketch pad and it made it just like so much more of an enjoyable experience. The only drawback is that the matte screen protector of the paper like slightly dulls that beautiful iPad retina display. But for me personally that is a trade-off that I am willing to make to get a much better feel when I'm drawing. One other thing I set my iPad to never auto lock. Unless I push the lock button or close the iPad case, it doesn't automatically go to sleep or lock itself. This is because like when I'm reviewing my artwork or I'm taking a quick break or I'm answering a text or I need to change my camera angle because I'm filming a YouTube video, I don't want it to go to sleep. The face ID to unlock it does not work very well when it's sitting flat on a table. The angle is just not right, which means I either have to do this super weird like ultra lean over the desk to try to get it to recognize my face or wait for it to fail and then enter my passcode and then it finally unlocks and doing that over and over and over again during the process of making a piece of digital art just gets super annoying. Moving on to the rest of my main art station, I have this Lenovo ThinkPad as a reference laptop. I used to have a nicer laptop here, but I traded it to Nikki so she can have a better laptop for managing orders and handling customer service and just staying on top of the whole merch operation. I figured she deserved the better computer because all I'm doing is like looking up reference images on it or watching YouTube videos <laughs> as I'm painting or drawing or whatever. I have it hooked up to this 55 inch Amazon Fire TV via HDMI. This is really nice because let's say I needed to like draw a picture of a crocodile. I can just look up a few images of a crocodile and put them on this huge screen so I have a nice big reference as I draw. When I need reference images, I like to use Pexels, Envato Elements, and Motion Array to look up images that are okay to use for commercial use and I have the license to use. 
When I draw something, it usually looks pretty different from the reference, because I have a weird style. <laughs> but it's nice to play it extra safe when it comes to copyright. Out of the three I mentioned, Pexels is really great, because it's totally free. I have paid subscriptions to Envato Elements and Motion Array, but Pexels is free. I definitely recommend you take a quick peek at each website's license agreement on your own, and familiarize yourself with their license agreements to make sure that the reference images that you're using are kosher. I also have this really simple mouse, the Logitech, and this like really low-end keyboard that's not even wireless nothing fancy since this table is also my painting table and stuff will inevitably end up getting covered in paint and other art supplies but yeah these are the tools and supplies I use to make digital art okay so I have shown you the tools the iPad the art station where the magic happens and now it's time to actually take you through my full process of making a complete piece of digital artwork but before we jump into that and I ramble about all the nitty-gritty details of that. I want to let you know that this video is brought to you by Squarespace. That's right, Squarespace is a website where you can build a flipping website. Wrap your head around that, why don't you? But one thing that's not hard to wrap your head around is how easy it is to build a website on Squarespace. They have these beautiful, award-winning templates, and all you got to do is drop your awesome content into their awesome templates, and the awesomeness and the awesomeness come together and swirl around, and boom you got yourself a website. I've been using Squarespace for years. I love it. It's where I host my merch, my online portfolio. I have subscription products like T-shirt of the month on there. You can even make member exclusive areas. If you wanted to do something like paywall, very special content or tutorials or stuff like that on your website, Squarespace has all that and so much more. They're so feature rich. And if you do ever run into any issues, they have 24 seven customer support. So go to squarespace.com to start your free trial. And then when you're ready to launch your site, go to squarespace.com forward slash 10 hundred to get 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Huge. It's super important to have a website and Squarespace makes it easy. Okay, let's jump into this artwork. Okay, on to the apps on the iPad. So the first app I use is called Procreate. This is the app I use for pencil sketching and this is where the majority of the initial creative spark happens. The sketch is ever so important. It's the roadmap for this whole thing. My stock generic size for my documents is usually 15 inches by 20 inches. And this is because that is kind of the principal area of a t-shirt. And each month I design a new t-shirt for my t-shirt of the month subscription I have on my website. And that's the type of digital art I'm making most frequently, consistently. Of course, the dimensions will change depending on the project. Like if I work on a mural concept, I'm gonna wanna change the dimensions to actually like match up with the wall. But one thing that does stay the same on all my art files is the DPI. This is a big one, guys. It's always set to 300 DPI. 300 DPI is needed if you want to print your art physically, like on physical products that exist in the real world. 72 DPI is for like web resolution stuff, internet graphics, stuff that's always going to live on your computer. But 300 DPI is for printing. I think Procreate and many other art programs default to somewhere between 72 and 150 DPI, and I really wish they wouldn't do that. But you got to make sure that you go in and change it to 300 DPI if you ever have plans to have any physical objects made like art prints, posters, t-shirts, skateboards, playing cards, books, like all that stuff is going to require 300 DPI. For this sketching section of the video, I'm working on a t-shirt design, which will probably be my next upcoming t-shirt of the month design. As I said, I do these every month. And since I'm already making this video about digital art, let's go ahead and kill two birds with one stone and come up with the next t-shirt design. Another difference between my previous iPad and my new one is that at 15 inches by 20 inches with 300 dpi the maximum amount of layers I could have on procreate was 15 layers on the old one but on the new one it's more than double that and I can have 34 layers with these exact same document settings so that's a good reason to upgrade now when it comes to drawing in procreate I pretty much use one single pencil in the brush library and that is is the peppermint pencil. It's literally like the first pencil in the pencil category. <laughs> I'm a simple man. I just think it looks great. It behaves like a real pencil. I think it's the best looking pencil in Procreate and it's just, it's just good. It's just real, real good and I love it. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. So when it comes to drawing, I'm a self-taught artist. And because of that, sometimes 
I do things a little bit differently than professionally trained artists. For instance, I don't typically rough out my entire composition and then start slowly refining it to a final version. I actually draw things in small chunks and render them to near completion and then slowly build up my composition with fully rendered little pieces like chunk by chunk piece by piece I'm like fully drawing stuff out. I think the correct way to draw like a body is to maybe draw a rough circle for the head and then like a boxy shape for the torso and then like an oval for the hips and then some stick figure limbs and then you know slowly build that up by refining your shapes adding musculature or clothing i almost never do that i just <laughs> fully sketch a completed head and then i fully sketch a completed torso area and then i fully sketch one arm and then the next i'm not using <laughs> like shapes and and rectangles and triangles and circles very much i'm just like drawing it out it's probably a strange and inefficient way to draw but i I like to see things complete and get a sense of what I'm making at each step of the way. I guess it can hurt you if you get far into your drawing and then realize that something isn't working. It's probably totally wrong, but it's how my brain needs to be, so it's right and I've gotten pretty good at working this way. One setting in Procreate that I like to make sure is on is the brush cursor is showing. When you switch the brush cursor on, the outline of your brush shape will appear when you touch the canvas. This is so you can kind of see the actual shape of the mark you're gonna make. Another quirk in my workflow is that I often don't erase. I'll draw one full element of my drawing, and then when I want another element to lay over the top of or intersect with another element, I'll make a new layer, then draw that element, then in between the first layer, Layer and the second layer, I'll make another layer of just the color white. With the brush set to a medium hard airbrush, I'll paint white over the top of the previous elements to basically hide them from view, but they're not gone. They're still there, just under that layer of white. This has the same effect as erasing, but it preserves those lines on the layer below while being hidden, just in case I need them in the future. And also it helps like if I wanna just adjust things a little bit, nudge my composition, I I can move my pencil marks around without necessarily like having to redraw all those lines because I already erased them. It's just a flexibility thing. Another thing that I'll do when I'm sketching is I'll switch my pencil colors just to help me not get lost in my sketch. I'll start with like just black. Then when I add a new element, maybe I'll switch to like a deep maroon. And then when I add another element, maybe I'll do like a navy. And this just helps me keep things visually separated and know what element I'm working on and what layer I'm working on. One thing I really love about Procreate is their whole hold for line or hold for circle feature. You can draw a rough line and then keep holding your pencil to the canvas and will snap into a straight line. And the same can be done for circles. You draw a rough circle, hold your pencil to the canvas, and it will snap into a clean circle or oval similar to the one you originally drew. Love that feature. <laughs> I also really like to work in layer groups. I'll make one giant group for all my layers. And this is because like when you, when you go to the mover tool, you can move your entire drawing or composition anywhere on the canvas. And this is the only way I've figured out to be able to affect all my layers simultaneously. And then I'll often use subgroups of like for individual characters or individual elements or individual body parts and then move every layer within that group around in your composition and then in the end on layers where I have sketched in red or blue or whatever I can make them black again by turning on the alpha lock on that layer and this allows you to only affect the marks that you've already made so I turn on alpha lock grab a big brush of just black and then just scribble my apple pencil over the entire document and it'll just basically do like a color overlay on those marks I've already made and change them from red to black or navy to black or whatever and and then once I'm done with my pencil sketch, I just quickly export it as a JPEG so that I can bring it into the next app I use. The next app I'm gonna use is Adobe Fresco for the inking. I'll import my drawing with this photo icon right here and then make sure the size is adjusted correctly and then make a new layer and select the vector brush. There is one and only one reason I use this app and that is vector brushes. It's great to be able to ink with vector brushes. I used to ink my art in Procreate and sometimes not even ink them at all and just use the pencil lines as my final lines for the art that I'm making. But with the vector brushes in Adobe Fresco, this opens up a huge amount of flexibility for the artwork 
and what I can do with it. You see, there are a couple different kinds of graphics. There's raster graphics that uses pixels to make what you see. Those pixels are a set size and a set resolution. And once you start scaling up your art and making it bigger and bigger, each one of those individual pixels gets bigger and bigger and lower and lower quality. But on the other hand, there's vector graphics. And vector graphics use math and geometry to make lines and shapes. And no matter how large you scale them up, the shapes and lines stay the same. But in my opinion, vectors can have this very sort of like stark, digital, clean look to them. And some of that hand-drawn aesthetic can be lost when you're vectorizing your art. And I'm not a fan of working inside of Adobe Illustrator, which is like the main vector program. To me, it's like the opposite of a free-form, creative, expressive art program. And the workflow feels less creative and more like analytical and scientific. But with Adobe Fresco, you can use vector brushes. You can just grab your pencil and start hand drawing with vector lines and they look very hand drawn and to my eye they look no different than if I were to ink my drawing inside of Procreate with these raster ink brushes. Fantastic. If you're new to Fresco, you may be wondering what this little circle on your screen is. When you press it down once, it switches to an eraser of the same brush settings as your current brush. But one thing I just learned, which is super cool, is that when you want to make two lines meet with a perfect corner, you can make your lines go past the meeting point, and with the button triple tapped, you can just draw a line through the extra part that you don't want, and it'll erase the part past the meeting point, and this is like a cheat code <laughs> for making lines meet up and it's too cool and I just learned this and I love it. I'll often downscale my canvas in fresco to 11 inches by 14 inches. Because I'm working in vector, it doesn't really matter what size my canvas is since I can easily upscale it later. I figure smaller canvas equals easier processing for my device. Anyway, I usually set my stock vector brush to size five. This feels like a good size on an 11 inch by 14 inch canvas. Then when I want to make certain areas like more bold and make them pop or add some graphic weight to the lines, I'll bump it up to a size eight brush. I make sure to have the pressure dynamic set to taper, give it a more realistic ink brush feel. So when I press soft, my lines are skinny. When I press hard, my lines are thicker. I generally keep my smoothing at 100 when I do vector inking and it'll have a really clean look to your lines with no shake but I do turn it down when I'm doing like cross hatching or something like shaggy fur or curly hair the smoothing kind of messes up those type of lines and it's doing some processing in the background and isn't quite fast enough to keep up with like fast and frantic lines like fur and cross hatching here's a quick clip of my brush settings in case anyone cares and wants to I don't know screenshot it or something in the fresco app settings I go to input and then brushes and then make sure my brush preview is set to brush stamp. This again, just like Procreate, makes it so that I can see a preview of my brush and the size of it, so I can see where I'm going. I think this is off by default, but having that little circle icon showing the location and size of my brush is very beneficial to not making stupid mistakes or, you know, just not knowing what you're doing. Now for the coloring. I am gonna stay here in fresco for this step. Since my inks are in vector, I want my colors in vector too. There's no point in having these amazing scalable lines if my colors aren't scalable as well. So, I wanna fill in my illustration with flat colors. First, I'm gonna set my digital ink layer as a reference layer. Setting it as a reference means it will use this layer as a guide for my fill tool, even when I'm working on a separate layer. So on next, I'm gonna create a new layer and use the paint bucket tool or the fill tool. I'm gonna to select a color I want and then click in an area I want to fill. Fresco is gonna ask me if I wanna fill with vector or pixel. And yes, I do indeed want vector. The rest of this step is pretty simple. I'm I'm just gonna keep selecting the colors I want and fill in the areas I want. This is why it was important for me to close all the gaps while I was inking because the fill tool is gonna fill in areas that are encased by line art and it's gonna keep going and going until it hits a full on line art barrier. And if I leave little gaps, it's not gonna know when to stop and it's gonna make my job harder when I'm doing these flat colors. It's like a coloring book. It doesn't wanna go past the lines. Sometimes when I do have a missed gap, I gotta grab my paintbrush and grab the color black, go back to my line layer, close that little gap definitely make sure I'm going back to my colors layer and I'm not filling in on the line layer because if you forget to go back to the right layer and you're filling and filling just happy as a clam and then you realize like 15 minutes later that you've been working on your line layer the whole time and you have to hit undo like a 50 bajillion times and all that work is wasted and come on we've all been there we've all been there where we're working on the wrong layer 
sucks. Okay, so once my flats are done, I'll create another new layer above my flat color, but below my inks layer. And this is gonna be for shading. I'll go back to my vector brush and choose a shadow color and just work on, you know, one area at a time using the shadow color for that area. And then I'll grab a highlight color and I'll do some highlights in that area and fully render it out kind of chunk by chunk. And it gives it this very graphic, you know, anime, comic book, cell shading style. And I really, really like that aesthetic. And it really works well for t-shirt design because you know, when you silk screen print, they basically make a new screen for every individual color that you have in your artwork. And doing stuff like blends and gradients is a little bit more tricky when it comes to screen printing. So it's really fun to work with the limitation of like just working with flat colors. And on top of that, I really like the aesthetic of that. Hard shadows, hard highlights, Lights, choosing the right color to just really make the artwork pop trying to make it look as rendered as possible with the limitations of you know single colors this process of shading can take quite a bit of time and I'll just slowly work my way around the illustration and that's my colors I think they turned out pretty nice now I want to finalize the design on my computer. First, I'm gonna to wanna to export this art out of Fresco as an Adobe Illustrator file. Fresco lets me open an Illustrator copy on desktop. Once it beams over the Illustrator file, I can go ahead and resize the image back to around 15 inches by 20 inches. At this point, I'm gonna to wanna to save a copy of this as an Illustrator file so that it can be the official like vector version that just lives on my hard drives until I need it again in case I wanna make it larger some point for some other project. So after I resize it, I can go ahead and export it also as a Photoshop file. I wanna make sure I export all the layers to Photoshop and set the anti-aliasing to art optimized. And of course, I'm gonna set it to 300 DPI or PPI. Those terms are like interchangeable. I'll work in Photoshop to finalize the design and make it suitable for a t-shirt of the month print. At this point in Photoshop, it's no longer vector, but now that it's the correct size for the t-shirt print, it's okay if it's raster graphics because I know that the final destination is a shirt. So in Photoshop, I'm going to make each color its own layer. I don't necessarily have to do this because my t-shirt printers would do this for me if I just gave them like a flat image, but I find it easier to pick Pantone colors with each color on its own layer. So the way that I do this is first I flatten all the colors that I did in Fresco together into one layer and my inks are on a separate layer and I grab the magic wand tool and select one color. I have an action recorded in Photoshop so that when I hit the F4 key, it will copy what I have selected, then create a new layer, then paste in place what's been copied. This way I can promote each color to a new layer just by hitting F4. If you work in Photoshop and you haven't played around with setting up action, I highly recommend watching some tutorials on that subject. It saves a lot of time. Anyway, once all my individual colors are on their own layer, I double click the layer and then choose color overlay. And in my color picker, I go to the library section. This way I can pull up the Pantone library and choose just from available Pantone colors. Pantone colors are a universal color code and my t-shirt printers use Pantone inks to print my t-shirts. It's a way to make sure that the colors I want can be communicated to the manufacturer. So so if you don't have them in your version of Photoshop, you might want to research how to get them. Recently, they've been removed from Photoshop due to a super annoying dispute between Adobe and Pantone. So you can get them either by paying a monthly subscription fee to Pantone or um, there's other, I'm just gonna be quiet about that now. So I'm starting with Pantones that are closest to my original color, but I also click around and experiment with colors to see if there are shades I like better. Photoshop is the easiest place to play around with like global color adjustments. None of the iPad art apps I have give me like advanced tools like Pantones or quick and easy ways to select one color globally across your entire artwork and then make tone adjustments or stuff like that. When I'm doing my digital coloring in Fresco, I kind of know in the back of my head the whole time that like this is close to what I want, but I'm gonna play around with it in Photoshop. To me, it's so fun and relaxing to sit there and like just try out all the different colors and see how the subtle changes in color affect the image and the vibes it gives off. This is one of my favorite steps for sure. Once that I've chosen a color, I rename the layer with its Pantone code so I can easily tell what it is and then provide those numbers to my printer later.
here. So now that my colors are looking good, I open up my t-shirt mock-ups. I use these mock-ups by Photofic. They're really cool because they're based on the actual blank t-shirt brands. Back in my Photoshop file, I make a copy of all the layers and then I merge all those copies into one flat image and drop that onto the shirt mock-up. These mock-ups have all the stock colors that those brands actually come in. I really think it pops on the banana cream yellow, but I also think the design really pops on black. And it'll also be nice because my black line art can be one less color I need to pay to print because the black lines can be provided by the garment instead of needing to actually print them with ink. I put this design on the back of the t-shirt and I would love to take like just my noodle font for the left front chest print. So I jump back over to Fresco to edit the noodle font. Now that I have my chest print done, I put that on the mock-up of the front of the t-shirt and now I have a completed t-shirt design. Feels good, baby. This design took me three days to make, and I make one of these every single month for my T-shirt of the month subscription, where people sign up and they get a surprise T-shirt I designed in the mail each month. This is the first time I've revealed an upcoming design before it's out, but I thought this would make for a good way to explain my full digital process while also knocking out a new design I needed to get done. But now that my design is done, I'll email it over to Amy over at T Productions. They're an awesome screen printing shop and their facility is about 45 minutes away from my studio. I like supporting the local shop, plus we save on shipping charges because we can just drive down there and pick it up. And they do really awesome work. So yeah, now that that's sent off, I just wait for the shirts to be printed. I think this illustration came out super cool and I think the t-shirts are gonna be some of my favorites. I really like this noodle design. Hooray, and that is my full process of how I make digital art from start to finish. Boom. Now make sure you go to tenhun.com, get signed up for the t-shirt of the month subscription, and get your hands on this, this beautiful shirt right here. Get this one. It's cool. You'll look great in it. I think you will. I think you look great no matter what, but this will make you look even better. Tenhun.com.